opportunity to look around while you're here. We've got you open. We have a very special exhibit uh, that's just on the other side of this wall. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinarily professional exhibit uh, done by the Cincinnati Museum Center on the Civil War. And uh, I, I, I don't mind quoting a colleague uh, who just happens to be Jim Harris, who's director of the Lee County Museum in Lovington. Uh, he said this was the best exhibit that's ever been in Lake County. So I hope you'll take a minute to, to take a look and come back because there's no way you can see all of it tonight. Uh, a couple of things. We have a lot of programs, uh, and, and uh, I'm not going to take Dr. Blizzard's time to, to mention all of them, but tomorrow night uh, on Lincoln's birthday, we're going to show glory. Now, I, I can never go in a museum. Uh, or look at a film without looking at it from a research standpoint. And I want to tell you that from my end, uh, that uh, Glory is an extremely well-researched film. It's very, almost a documentary. It's, it's very good. The other thing that uh, I want to mention tonight is that uh, we are starting a membership program. And really, uh, a membership program is for participation. Uh, we get enough dues to do the newsletter. And that's about it. But we want people to use this facility in a lot of ways, not just from the standpoint of coming and uh, what we call lifelong learning. Uh, because our, our center, our core, our mission is education. And we'll continue to try to uh, promote that as long as, as, long as we're here. Uh, so it's, a, it's an opportunity to keep abreast of everything that is happening and an opportunity to become a part of what we're doing because we're looking for volunteers, and I'll only throw out one thing that I know all of you are going to line up for. And that is, uh, ideally, before too long, we'll really be accepting materials, uh, cultural materials that we need help in uh, accession. So you don't really get to handle this real good stuff. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a rewarding experience, whether you're a docent uh, for a group of school children, or you're actually handling so we, we hope that you will think about that. I don't have to have any notes to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, I, it's hard for me to pin down exactly when we met, but it was in the early 60s, maybe uh, real early 60s. He was my pastor at uh, the First Christian Church in Lovington, New Mexico. And I lived in Buckeye and was uh, going to school in, in Lovington. The, uh, the attraction to the church, I have to admit, was possibly because he was a hunter and fisher. Because we did an awful lot of it. Uh, but I will tell you that he influenced me enough to recommend me, and I went to Eastern New Mexico as the first youth minister on campus at, at Eastern New Mexico for uh, the First Christian Church. He saw something bigger than the ministry that he was, he was in. And borrowed money to go to the University of Texas and start uh, several degrees uh, centered and around Hebrew studies. Uh, probably the most important thing I think, and he would, uh, I've heard him say this so I can repeat it, is his knowledge now and uh, acquaintance with and now mastery of the Hebrew language, both written and oral. Uh, I will tell you a short story because uh, when we went to, I went to Israel and Jordan and then later on Egypt with Dr. Blizzard. And w when, when we were with natives there, the, the, uh, the Israelis and or in the case of uh, Egypt, uh, he, would, he would interpret things in Hebrew and they would say his Hebrew is perfect. It has no colloquialism. It, it, is, it is pure. And uh, the other thing that surprised me, uh, having known him for some time, is that we would go in a restaurant and people would recognize him. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, but Dr. Blizzard uh, got his PhD in Hebrew studies and, and taught at UT as a professor, but started excavating sites in Israel uh, from the late 60s uh, until just almost the other day. Uh, I know of no one uh, living today that can put the uh, archaeological record 
in a historical perspective uh, based on the original Hebrew text of the Bible better than Dr. Blizzard. And I, that's, that's a broad statement, but I think we can back it up. So I will, I will end this by saying that uh, in 1972, I had a master's degree from Eastern New Mexico University and uh, didn't get hired by the game department, fortunately. Uh, and came back to Hobbs, New Mexico, and was working in the oil fields on the <coughs> dairy floor, as a rough name. And started, tried to start a museum in the old Will Rogers Elementary School. And the first speaker I brought, guest speaker I brought, was Dr. Roy Blizzard, 1972. So it's my distinct pleasure, privilege, honor to introduce Dr. Roy Blizzard. said we go back a long way and I go back a long way with some of you all here as well. Uh, I must say that Calvin was very influential in me getting my start not just in uh, Hebrew studies but in uh, archaeology. I finished uh, my first master's degree at Eastern New Mexico University and then I had the opportunity because I had a friend of mine that was studying at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and when he found out that I had finished a master's degree in anthropology and archaeology he invited me to come to Jerusalem and to live with him and study at the Hebrew University. Well, it was one of the worst mistakes I ever made. I went to the bank, borrowed money to go, and I wasn't over there six weeks till I found out that everything that I had ever learned was wrong. It was either wrong or it was Mickey Mouse. And uh, I came back and I told uh, my wife, I said, you know, I can't continue to do what I'm doing and be intellectually honest. So I went back to the bank, and I borrowed more money, and I went to uh, Austin, Texas, took two years of Hebrew in 12 weeks, and then went into intermediate graduate study. And while I was at the university uh, studying Hebrew, because I already had a master's in archaeology, the Six-Day War broke out. You remember 1967? And my instructor uh, at the university uh, was a captain in the Israeli army, and he had to leave just like that to go back. And in a week, he was back. And uh, uh, as a result, Israel gained access to territory that uh, was uh, previously closed off because it was part of the West Bank, and uh, Israelis weren't allowed or were allowed to... Uh, explore or excavate. And what happened is that just like that, immediately, they started excavating at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And my uh, professor at the University of Texas, his name was Dr. Aharon Baradon, he sent me to Israel to excavate with Professor Benjamin Mazal at the Temple Mount. And I started excavating there with them at the very beginning of the excavations in 1968 and then kept continuing back again two and three times a year excavating uh, at the Temple Mount. And finally when the excavations there were uh, slowing down just a little bit, uh, Professor Mazar encouraged me to start excavating with his nephew Amichai Mazar, who's now the head of the Department of Archaeology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And we worked at that uh, site called Tel Kassila, and I'll show you uh, some of the uh, uh, excavation and some of the artifacts there, but it was a completely unique archaeological site in Israel. And then, uh, just uh, a couple of years ago, Ami calls me on the phone and wants me to uh, join with his cousin, Elat Mazar, 
excavating at a Phoenician site up near the Lebanese border called Aksim. And we excavated there for some time in a Phoenician cemetery. But some of you may have uh, read about uh, a lot uh, because she's the one who just recently excavated in Jerusalem, very close to the Temple Mount, and discovered what she believes to be David's palace. Have you read about that? You heard about that? Well, a lot's a very good friend of mine. I know where she's excavated. Uh, it's a, quite an exciting uh, dig and uh, some very uh, interesting uh, artifacts that are coming out of the uh, excavations there on that site. And I want to just share with you for a few moments this evening uh, a few ideas about uh, archaeology, what's going on. Uh, I know that uh, Calvin has started to say something to you about it because he had the papers in his hand, in his hand and he didn't. But uh, some time ago, Calvin and I sat down and we said, you know, something needs to be done as far as uh, not just religious education, but just as far as education is concerned. <coughs> because we're taking the best of the young men and women that we have and we're sending them <laughs> off to some uh, Bible college or theological school or some other major university. And in most instances, when they graduate, they come out with a degree that uh, unless they're in some kind of a scientific discipline or uh, some more specialized field that uh, renders them completely incapable of doing uh, serious work, uh, and especially is this true in the biblical field. So we said in order for the best of our students to understand what's going on uh, in the Middle East, uh, especially this is true in uh, Israel, Jordan, Greece, Italy, the lands of the Bible, they need to actually be on site, to have the experience to be there and see that. And so we have started what we call historical and archaeological study programs. Now, these are not little uh, Mickey Mouse tours. Uh, they're not pilgrimages. They're study programs where we take you to the actual historical archaeological site, and we travel the country from one end of it to the other. And the 6th of June, Calvin and I, along with Dr. Ron Mosley from the American Institute of Holy Land Studies, along with uh, Dr. William McDonald. And by the way, some of you may have seen Dr. McDonald on uh, television. He has a program on God's Learning Channel. He was one of my students. I supervised his dissertation. Uh, he will be going. And we're going to go through all of Israel and all of Jordan and the participants can get up to nine hours of college credit for participation in the course. And here, uh, right here, you'll see the whole itinerary if any of you are interested and you might like to take one of them with you. Let's talk just a little bit about archaeology. Archaeology might be interpreted as that branch of historical science that patiently searches out, interprets, records the material, the remains of man's bygone past. It's concerned with the systematic investigation, classification, restoration, interpretation, and publication of all materials from which a knowledge of a particular country or a particular people might be derived. It's constantly contributing invaluable materials that substantiate, that supplement, that uh, increase uh, historical facts. Today, uh, 
it's kind of a sad situation, really, uh, that you have two major schools of thought. Basically, to be honest with you, neither one of them know what they're talking about. Uh, but you have over here on this one side of the coin, those that call themselves minimalists. Have you heard that term? That is, they're the ones who take hardly anything that the Bible says at face value. And then there are the maximalists over on this side of the corner, and they're the ones who take everything that the Bible says at face value. And the truth of the matter is that the truth is usually somewhere in between. So archaeology, because it has the ability to substantiate, to confirm, or to refute historical fact, is often referred to as the handmade history. Today, and this wasn't always the case, archaeology commands respect as a full-fledged science. However, as I mentioned, it wasn't always the case. For many centuries, travelers to the Middle East, to the lands of the Bible, they brought back reports of various monuments and inscriptions and writings, but no one knew what they said or what they meant or how to read them. And it seemed that it was destined to be a mystery. Many of the people that visited the land were just uh, researchers or explorers. And that was before that we actually had at our land the tools that would allow us to be uh, archaeologists as we are today. Researchers, however, in the lands of the Bible took a giant step forward in 1798 with a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon organized an Egyptian expeditionary force and he took with him from France nearly 100 scholars and artists that were commissioned to investigate, to report, to uh, try to attempt to understand the ancient civilization of Egypt as well as the many monuments of the country. And the most notable of the discoveries that he made was called the Rosetta Stone. Have you heard of the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone actually is one of the most important archaeological discoveries that was ever made. As uh, you can see, a very unimposing uh, artifact, but if you'll notice carefully, you can see that it's a trilingual inscription. There's register one, register two, register three. And the first register was in Egyptian hieroglyphics. The stone itself is at the British Museum and in this special case, so you can't really get an idea of the size, but it's three feet by nine inches high two feet, four and a half inches wide, and eleven inches thick. And it's a trilingual description, again, in three languages, only one of which was known at that time. The first register was Egyptian hieroglyphics, the pictograph language that you find everywhere all over the country of Egypt, from one end of the country to the other, on temples and monuments and tombs. The second register is a form of ancient uh, Egyptian called demotic, and the third register was in Greek, which was a known language. The story of the translation of the hieroglyphic text is an interesting study in and of itself, but suffice for us this evening to say that it took a young scholar, a little French scholar, only 18 years old at the time, by the way, 
by the name of Jean-Francois Champollion, or Jean Francis Champollion. Uh, it took him 23 years of diligent work to decipher the hieroglyphic text and to announce to the world that the key to the ancient language of Egypt had been found. And that was in 18 and 22. Then again, in 1835, an Egyptian armed officer that was attached to the Persian army noticed a large bas relief that was 350 feet above the face of the cliff in Persia that had some kind of an inscription. And realizing its possible importance, Henry C. Rollins undertook an exceedingly hazardous task of copying the text with a paper cast or a squeeze. It took him four years to complete the cast of the uh, entire inscription, but that was just the beginning. And just as the Rosetta Stone, it was a trilingual inscription. After 22 years, Rawlinson had successfully translated the texts of Old Persian, Median, and Babylonian cuneiform. The scholarly work of these two men furnished the keys that unraveled the mystery of the ancient Tigris, Euphrates, Nile River valleys, and propelled archaeology a giant step forward. And it went through several different steps or stages. It wasn't until a man by the name of Heinrich Schliemann, who was excavating at Troy, discovered that he was dealing with the successive superimposed occupation levels or stratigraphic layers, as they're called today, one imposed right on top of the other. So that when you're excavating in the Middle East, particularly in Israel, Jordan, you're in a completely different kind of archaeological context than you are here in New Mexico or in the, the, the great Southwest. Because here, usually, unless we happen to be exploring or excavating in a mound, uh, such as uh, uh, Mesa Verde, uh, uh, that kind of a, a Pueblo context, we're simply uh, dealing with a, uh, a camp, a campsite. And, uh, they may have lived there and lived in the area, but they were basically nomadic and they wandered from one place to the other, but such is not the case in the Middle East. You're dealing with a tell, a mound, of the successive occupation on a particular site that may go all of the way back, uh, for example, at Jericho to the pre-pottery Neolithic, about 9,000 B.C. And uh, as I said, it took a number of years for the early researchers or archaeologists to perfect the method or technique. In 1890, a man by the name of Sir Flinders Petrie who's known today as the father of biblical archaeology, noticed that in each of these different stratigraphic layers or the occupation levels, there was a different type of pottery that you could identify by the pottery that was in the particular stratigraphic layer or stratigraphic level, the date of that particular occupation level. And he developed what is known today, and we use it until this day, the pottery index method for determining the day. And the simple fact is that in most instances, we can more accurately determine the date of an occupation level just by the pottery that we find in the level than if we impose some kind of laboratory method and technique uh, on the uh, the particular artifact, whatever it might be. Now, those that would follow him, such as 
Clarence Stanley Fisher would develop a method or technique in archaeological excavation that we use until this present day is called the stratigraphic method. And it involves the careful study of a mound or a tail. And uh, here you see one such. This mound or tail is just on the outskirts of modern day Tel Aviv. It's known as Tel Pasila. And it was here in 1972 that we excavated in this area <coughs> excuse me, a Philistine temple. The only one of its kind that's ever been excavated. Artifacts completely unique. No one had ever seen anything like them before. And so when we came back to the site again in uh, 1973, we decided that we wanted to open up the area in and around the temple. And I'm going to use these next uh, few slides just to show you the methods that we use in so doing. We assemble the students on the site, give them instructions as to what they're going to do. And you notice how that they have divided this particular area off into sections, 10 meters by 10 meter, with a one meter wall or vault in between. As they began to uh, excavate down, every single piece of pottery that they find uh, because we use the pottery as a method for dating the particular occupation level, will be placed into one of these buckets that will then be taken down from the tail. And uh, as they continue down, uh, they do so, again, as I mentioned, an occupation level at a time. Now, I want to call your attention to just one thing right now because we're going to look at it again later on toward the end of the lecture, and that's the area over here on the back side of the tail. Over here on this back side of the tail, we're excavating in a different kind of context, and it was over there that we found a series of Roman burials, and I'll mention that to you again in just a moment. But as the uh, buckets of pottery are taken down from the mound or the tail, every single pottery shirt is examined, washed, carefully examined, and many of them are just simply discarded or uh, thrown away. But in some instances, we will find a vessel, although it may be uh, broken, that is fairly uh, easy to restore. And we have a special uh, pottery expert that restores all the vessels. And uh, they have uh, um, a technique for uh, putting all of these little pieces together, like someone would uh, put together a crossword puzzle. And so we are not all that concerned about whether uh, the vessel is broken or whether it's not. And as we excavate down, you notice they clean it a level at a time. They'll go in and they'll dust and uh, sweep the floor. And then every single artifact will be measured. It will uh, be then uh, committed to the grid paper so that that becomes a, a part of a permanent record uh, for the, uh, uh, the site uh, as uh, we progress uh, throughout the course of the uh, expedition. Now here you notice one of the vessels. Uh, this particular vessel was some kind of an offering that was made upon the altar. And here you see the remnants of the altar in the uh, Philistine uh, temple again here at uh, Tel Kassila. And this particular vessel was so unique that it is still today one of the major exhibits at the Hebrew Museum in uh, Jerusalem uh, because it uh, has no uh, parallel in all of the uh, many uh, thousands and tens of thousands of artifacts that have been found in the excavations of Israel, in Israel. 
Uh, this vessel happens to be some kind of a cultic vessel in which some kind of offering was placed and offered up on the altar. And again, it's Philistine and dates about 1200 B.C. And this particular site uh, where we were excavating was probably destroyed during the Davidic con uh, conquest uh, during the reign of King David. Now, when we talk about archaeology and the methods and the techniques uh, in archaeology and Bible lands, we usually are dealing with three types or categories or classes of remains. Monumental, artifactual, and written. And that is what distinguishes archaeology from the other historical sciences. It's distinguished only by the kinds of materials with which we are concerned. So when we talk about a monumental remain, we would be talking about something like this wall, which happens to be the western wall, which is also uh, sometimes called the Wailing Wall in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this is the uh, section that's known as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. And up on top, you see the Golden Dome Mosque of Omar, or the Dome of the Rock, as it's also known. So a monumental remain would also be uh, a tower, such as this Tower of David in the wall of the city of Jerusalem. Or you'd be talking about a gate. Here you notice the entrance gate. This is the pathway going in to uh, the city of Gezer. If you remember, the biblical text says that Solomon fortified Gezer, Megiddo, and Chatzor. And we have found in all three places the entrance gate. They're all the same. They look like two E's that are facing one another. And here you see just one side of it. And this would be the pathway in, and the other side over here hadn't been excavated as yet when this uh, picture was taken, but this is the entrance gate into the uh, city of Gezer. Uh, we also uh, would classify a tunnel. Now here you see the tunnel of Hezekiah in Jerusalem that was constructed by King Hezekiah about 701 uh, B.C. to provide water into the city from the pool of Siloam. Or we'd be talking about such things as a fortress, and this is the fortress of Masala. Herod's magnificent fortress on the Dead Sea. And uh, I'm sure that as uh, Calvin looks at it, that it brings back a lot of memories because he and I have been all over this fortress from one end of it to the other. Uh, this is the uh, northern uh, end of the fortress, and this is the uh, southern end, the western side, and the east it looks forward, uh, toward uh, the uh, Dead Sea. Here's a smaller fortress, although you'll probably uh, remember one of the principal events that's mentioned in the New Testament that took place here. You remember when they took Saul, or Paul, uh, from Jerusalem, and he was on his way to Rome, that they stopped and spent the night at Antipatris. And this is the fortress of Antipatris. Uh, just uh, right on the edge of the uh, rolling hill countries it slopes off toward the Mediterranean Sea. Or we'd be talking about a church or a synagogue or as uh, you saw a moment ago, uh, a mosque. All of those would be considered monumental remains, but at times associated with the actual <coughs> Monumental remain would be a second category of remains that we're going to uh, mention in a moment. Uh, written remains and uh, this mosaic here on the floor of an ancient synagogue in Tiberias would be an example of a written remain while the synagogue itself would be an example of a monumental remain. Or it might be something uh, as simple as this oven. At Herod's fortress, this uh, was part of the uh, <coughs> palace complex of the palace of Herod the Great at the fortress of Masada, and this is the oven in the kitchen. Or 
when we talk about monumental remains, we might be talking about a tomb. It doesn't look like a tomb when you look at it, but this is one of the ancient Nabataean tombs from Petra, the red rock city of the Nabataeans over in Jordan. And we'll be going to Petra on the trip coming up. As a matter of fact, we'll be spending two days there. And uh, I will be taking you to uh, places at Petra that are stunning and absolutely <coughs> unbelievable. That, uh, this is one of them, a tomb, as you can see, carved out of the solid rock. Very uh, elaborate and ornate. Here's another interesting tomb. This is the family tomb. It's called the tomb of the sons of Ben Hazel that's uh, in Jerusalem. And you notice that it has the uh, columns into the entrance of the tomb. These columns, by the way, are of a style known as Doric. You're dealing with Corinthian, Ionic, and Doric column capitals. And this is one of the very few places where you see Doric uh, column capitals in the tomb of the family of Hazel in Jerusalem. And then right adjacent to it is the family, or is the tomb of, uh, of Zechariah the prophet, has the pyramidal the dome on the top. And from an elaborate tomb, we go to these tombs. Uh, in the sheer cliff of the Wadi of David, leading up to the spring in the pool of David at Ein Gedi. And notice very carefully, if you will, that on the tomb here, you see how its face has like a, a door entrance. All of these had that at one time, but uh, this one is still intact. And we found a very interesting sarcophagus in that uh, particular tomb, uh, unusual in that it was out of wood and incised or inlaid with ivory in all kinds of uh, elaborate uh, designs, and that is also in the museum at uh, the Hebrew University. Here is a very unusual uh, tomb. Uh, you notice it's just a large, great big boulder. And it has three locations for the man, the woman, and a small child. And this is a, a, a Roman cemetery from about the third century of the present era that was just right <coughs> alongside of the road as you go along the Sea of Galilee from Tiberias north. And the bulldozer widening the road happened to turn that boulder over and it is still there in situ along the side of the road. Probably all of the people that are buried in this particular cemetery all died about the same time and probably due to some kind of plague or it could have been uh, through armed conflict, but uh, a very unique uh, type of a tomb. Now, the next category of remains uh, with which we deal is artifactual. And an artifactual remain applies to anything that was made or modified by human art and workmanship. And here's a very beautiful uh, Maginda Bi, or Star of David, although in Hebrew it means a shield of David. And uh, this, as you can see, is part of a very ornate lintel that was a part of the synagogue that dates from the second, third century at Capernaum. At one time we thought that this was the synagogue where Jesus himself uh, preached and worshipped, but we know today that the synagogue at Capernaum today rests on the remains of the earlier synagogue from the time of Jesus. But uh, this uh, lintel would be an example of an artifactual remain. Here's another Magin David, and you notice that uh, it's very ornately uh, woven together. Uh, magnificent uh, 
art and architecture that we see on a lot of these uh, ancient uh, synagogues throughout the country. This is a very unusual uh, artifactual remain. Uh, do you all remember the story when the Ark of the Covenant was taken in battle when uh, Samuel and uh, his men were uh, fighting along the Valley of Ilan and the Ark was captured and taken over to the coast to the Philistine city of Ashdod. And they enjoyed it at all they could, so they sent it on down to Ashdod. And they enjoyed it all they could, and uh, they said, boy, we don't know what's going on here with this uh, Ark of the Covenant, but we don't know if this is God or if it's just a coincidence or what, but let's uh, set this Ark on a cart and uh, tether it uh, or uh, harness it to a, a milk cow and turn it loose and if it makes its way back to the camp of Israel then we'll know that it was uh, Israel's God. If not, we'll know that it was just a coincidence. And you remember how it says that the cow was going down the valley and all the way to the sun and then from there it was taken on uh, ultimately and made its way uh, into Jerusalem. But uh, scholars believe that this was an example of the ark on the cart that uh, was uh, representative of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, an artifactual remain could be something just as simple as these little cosmetic uh, tools or uh, the gaming uh, die. Uh, hey, you think that uh, shooting craps is uh, relatively recent? <laughs> this dates from uh, the uh, second century of the present era. These were found in uh, some of the caves inhabited by Bar Kokhba and his uh, men during the uh, <coughs> Jewish revolt in 132 to 135. Or uh, an artifactual remain could be a weapon of war such as these uh, arrow points here, or dart points, or spear points. But notice something very interesting. Those of you that know anything at all about point types, as Calvin does, will recognize some of these points that look like some of the points that we might find out here in the uh, Southwest. <coughs> However, these all date from a historical period of time, 2,000 years before they ever uh, show up here in our part of the country. Or they can be uh, something like these bronze arrow points or spear points. Weapons of war of all kinds, spears, axes, uh, arrow points, uh, all of them are uh, artifactual remains. Again, anything made or modified by human art and workmanship. Now this happens to be one of the uh, locations on our site where we were excavating in the uh, Philistine temple. And as I mentioned, we found all kinds of artifacts that we'd never seen before. And I'm showing you this one because right over here in the corner, there's something projecting out from the wall. And uh, I was standing here at the time I thought I was basically the supervisor of this particular locus. And uh, I noticed that it was uh, quite unusual. It didn't look like that it was made out of pottery as the rest of the remains here you see scattered on the floor. So I got down in the uh, grid and uh, started to dig and we extracted a remain that is quite unusual. Only two of them have ever been found anywhere in the Middle East, to my knowledge. And it was a conch shell shofar. You know what a shofar is? The, the ram's horn that they blew uh, for uh, repentance and remembrance. And here is the shofar. And here is Dr. Amichai Nazar. He was the director of the excavation. When it came out of the ground, 
I was the only one on the site that knew what it was because I'd seen the one that had been uh, discovered earlier at Hazard. And I went down and took a screwdriver and uh, cleaned it all out. And uh, he was talking on the telephone at the time when I walked in and blew the thing in his ear. <laughs> and uh, he liked to went nuts because it was, uh, as I say, so unique. And this shows him <laughs> blowing it here. Uh, now, we talked about monumental remains, artifactual remains, and the third category <laughs> of remains that we talk about or with which we deal is written remains. And of course, all of you have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And here's a page of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls on uh, a parchment. You all know what parchment is. It's the tanned animal hide. And uh, the hide from a young animal is called velvet. It's a finer grade of uh, animal skin. But uh, here's a portion of the Dead Sea Scroll, one of them. And there were many, many hundreds of them that were found. Now, let me just say a, a word or two about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because you've all heard story after story after story about the Dead Sea Scrolls. What was the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? To be real honest with you, there's not just a whole lot in the Dead Sea Scrolls that we didn't already know before we discovered them, insofar as the biblical text is concerned. There are a few things that we did learn from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the most valuable contribution that the Dead Sea Scrolls made, you probably have never even heard of. You may have heard of higher biblical criticism. You all ever heard of higher biblical criticism? You know what it is. That's where uh, scholars used to take the biblical text and they would divide it up into different sources. There was the Jehovah source, the Elohim source, the priestly source, the Deuteronomy source, and they said that just by looking at the divine names, the uses of divine names or diction and style, you could go in and divide the biblical text up into all this patchwork of JDP and D. And interestingly enough, that's still being taught in a lot of the Bible colleges and seminaries throughout the country. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, it knocked that theory in the head. Why? Because the theory was based upon an erroneous assumption that the Hebrew text of the Old Testament was committed to its final form about 400 B.C. during the time of Ezra. And from that point on and down till today, it had maintained a basically constant and uh, unchangeable uh, form so that by going again to the text, usage of divine names, dictions of style, parallel duplicate accounts, etc., that you could divide it up into this password of JBD. However, wouldn't you know, when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were hundreds of them. And there wasn't just one immutable text. There were many texts. There was a Hebrew text that was different than the present-day Masoretic text. There was a Greek text. There was a Hebrew text that was closer to the Greek Septuagint than it was to the Hebrew. And then there were texts that didn't even agree with one another. And you take some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which uh, I happen to have photographs of uh, some of the major Dead Sea Scrolls, and you lay them up against the uh, Hebrew Masoretic text today and they're not the same. They're different. And therefore, <clears throat> you can't go to any particular text and divide it up into a patchwork of J, E, P, and D based upon the constancy of any particular text. So what that did was it is not the whole theory of higher biblical criticism in the head, and we moved on to something else. But, uh, you know, as is often the case, uh, it takes a generation or two before uh, all of this stuff finally filters down to the pulpit. Now, this is uh, one of the uh, sheets of the Dead Sea Scrolls on <coughs> parchment, and the next one is a copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls on papyrus. And you know that papyrus was 
part of the inner core of the uh, papyrus plant, sage plant that grew along the Nile. Or that inscription might be something such as this cylinder of Sennacherib, which is in Babylonian cuneiform, a very complex language. And remember again, it was Henry Rawlinson that spent 23 years in deciphering, uh, deciphering the text so that these texts can be uh, read today. Or it could be something like this magnificent steel. This is called the steel of Seti the First. You remember he was one of the uh, pharaohs, very well known pharaoh, mentioned in the biblical text. And this particular uh, steel or inscription is in Egyptian hieroglyphics, and it was found of all places in Israel at Bethshan, which is way to the north. Very famous archaeological site, very famous historical site. You remember it was in Beth Shan that they nailed the bodies of Saul and Jonathan after they were killed in battle. And right here at the bottom in Egyptian hieroglyphics, it mentions uh, Beth Shan. Or it might be something as uh, simple as this uh, tombstone in ancient Greek. This is in unsealed Greek. It's all capital letters and all runs together. And this is an interesting inscription. It says here, Amos, Amos, Diakonu, you hear the name? De deacon, Diakonu, the deacon, T's of, and notice how they've got the first letter of the next word all uh, written here, and then it goes across. He's the deacon of the church uh, and this was found at the pool of Bethesda in uh, Jerusalem. Do you remember where uh, Jesus healed the crippled man who was uh, by the pool? Or it might be something quite simple. Uh, although this is simple, nonetheless it's quite important. Uh, this is one of a series of pottery fragments on which inscriptions were made during the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the siege of not just Jerusalem but all of Judea back in 596 and 597 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar came against the southern kingdom and laid waste to the, tem laid waste to the temple. And this is called the Lach Lachish Letters that were from Lachish and from one of the uh, captains there at Lachish who was sending these letters appealing for help out across the land. And in this one, it has the name of God here in ancient Phoenician script. It's yud he vav -He, or Yahweh, uh, on the uh, Lachish letter. Or it may be something just as simple as this little one word inscription. This was found on the leg, just a little round leg of a bowl that we excavated at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And it says in Hebrew, Korban. Korban means a sacrifice. And do you remember one time Jesus is upbraiding the scribes and the Pharisees and he's calling them hypocrites? because they say something is korban and so they don't fulfill their responsibilities of taking care of their elderly parents or uh, whatever but they would say that something was korban that is it was sacrifice they dedicated it to the temple and so they couldn't use it for anything else and this just validates that practice or that custom that is mentioned in the biblical text jesus is the one who mentions it says that they say that this is Korban, and up until this inscription was found, we had no uh, outside uh, sources to confirm that particular account. But this even shows you something else that uh, I ordinarily wouldn't mention it, but I mentioned it to Calvin, and he thought it was interesting, so I'll tell you. Do you remember, uh, Jesus makes another statement on one occasion. He said, 
that uh, he didn't come to destroy the law, but that he came to fulfill the law, remember? And he said, I came to fill it uh, to such a degree that not one jot or one tittle. Do you remember that? <coughs> it passed from the law till it's all fulfilled. Well, in Hebrew, it says that not one yod, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, or one cults. And a cults just means a thorn, like the thorn on a rose or the thorn on anything. And he says, not one yod or one coats. What was a coats? Well, a coats was a little decorative mark that the scribes would sometimes put on the top of the letters. You see that one? That looks like a chicken track. That's called a coats. Doesn't mean anything. No reason for it to be there other than they like it. And this is an example of that practice. He said, not one little yod or even the symbolic marks that are put on some of the letters of the alphabet will pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Sometimes the inscription may be just one letter. This is a very interesting uh, inscription here. Notice these are round, look like wheels, but they're actually what we call capital drums. If you knew much about Josephus and you read Josephus and he talks about Masada and the fortification of Herod's fortress and Masada uh, that I mentioned to you, you saw a picture of it a moment ago, he talks about the marble columns and all of the marble uh, works at Masada. What we got there to excavate, there weren't any. There wasn't any marble at uh, Masada. But what they did, they made these columns uh, a drum at a time. And then they stacked them on top of one another. And then they had a technique for stuccoing that column. For stuccoing the walls that gave the appearance of marble. And some of that <coughs> stuccoing is still on some of the columns at uh, Masada and on the walls today so that if somebody didn't tell you, you'd think, well, this was a marble column. But this tells you what column it is. This is column men. And it goes the third uh, drum up from the column. And this one over here is column Tzadi. And it goes the sixth uh, drum up from the bottom. And not only does it tell us where this column goes and what location and where it's supposed to be, but it also tells us one other thing. That they had conscripted Jews to build the fortress. Why? Because these are Hebrew letters. So, obviously, it was the Hebrews who were doing uh, all of this work. How many of you worked a crossword puzzle? Did you ever uh, run across uh, a big jug or an urn or something in a crossword puzzle and the answer was an E-word? E-W-E-R. E-word. This is the Lachish E-word. And you see the inscription here? It's the oldest known inscription in Hebrew. Dates back uh, before the time of King David. Back approximately to the time of Moses, when we read about Moses. And here's the other side I mentioned to you. you know, look here, because on the back side of the tail, we're going to be excavating in a Roman cemetery. Now here's a part over here, you see, a, a, a monumental remain. These are sarcophagi, date from the Roman period, about 325 of the present era. And on one of the lids of a sarcophagus, we found this very interesting inscription. Now, people, this 
inscription is very significant, more so than what probably any of you would think. It dates from the Byzantine period. You can see the Byzantine cross. It's in Greek, again, unsealed Greek. They misspelled the first word and it's only one letter, which indicates that the individual wasn't all that educated. It should look like an H instead of an N, but it says, He nimin ani amu orkos aonios. It says the ma'amin. Now, we have read in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that these disciples were first called, what? First called Christians at Antioch. <coughs> Except from all that we've been able to ascertain from our excavation in the land, they referred to themselves as ma'aminim, which means a believer. They didn't use the term. A Christian at all because it was Greek. And uh, it came from the Greek the word Christos. And so you have the Christianos, or the Christians from the Greek Christos, which just means anointed. And it's corresponding to the Hebrew Mashiach, or Messiah. <laughs> But they call themselves Ma'aminim believers, but there's not any Greek word Minimim. It's a transliteration of the Hebrew Ma'amin and shows this that in the fourth century of the present era, in Israel, throughout the land of Israel, those who followed Jesus were referring to themselves as Ma'aminim, or in Greek. Uh, many men. So I think that's very there. important. Uh, finish, it, finish it up, Roy. What? Finish it up. What else does it say? Um, what else does it say? It just says the believer John, Aniamu is the same as John, Orkos dwells Aonios in eternity. Or it could be translated as uh, the believer John is eternal abode or is eternal uh, dwelling. Now, archaeology is not just concerned alone with uh, the excavation of the site, but we're also concerned with the uh, exploration of the site. Uh, we'll uh, walk across the ground surface and uh, notice of artifacts that are uh, just on the surface because they're a lot of times just uh, turned up because of animals digging in the ground and they have a tendency to rise to the surface and in most cases uh, as I mentioned earlier only remnants are going to be found we'll see the foundations of uh, uh, a building or we'll see uh, broken pottery shirts by the tens and tens of thousands the broken and discarded, but however, by a careful investigation, by the decipherment of the inscriptions, uh, reading of the inscriptions, we're able to, as we look at these artifacts, know something about their facial features, for example. This is an anthropoid sarcophagus that was found down south uh, along the Mediterranean coast, quite near Egypt, as a matter of fact. And notice uh, the place for the earrings, the uh, uh, beard, <coughs> the high uh, Roman nose, the heavy brow. Uh, this is a, a mask from uh, Hazor that is from the Canaanite period in Hazor, about 2000 B.C., maybe uh, four to six hundred years before the time of Abraham. And uh, again, looking at the mask, uh, although it's stylized, we're able to tell something about uh, facial features or something about clothing styles 
look at the comparison between this uh, marble fragment of a man's foot and you can see the typical uh, kind of sandal that they uh, wore during the Roman period. This is an unusual artifact here. Uh, you can't tell it by looking at it. This is a skull that has been covered over with pottery. The eyes are seashells from the Mediterranean and they've tried to depict the facial features of the deceased. And this was found at Jericho and goes all the way back to the early Canaanite period at uh, Jericho. So we're concerned with uh, the identification of uh, skeletons. Uh, this is a skeleton from the Middle Bronze Age, uh, about 3000 uh, BC, from a small archaeological site called Tel Zror uh, to the north in Israel. And uh, this is quite an unusual uh, artifact. Uh, I call it an artifact, although it uh, could be uh, classified as uh, something besides just an artifact, because uh, certainly it wasn't made or modified by human art or workmanship. But this is, as you can see, the skull of a young woman along with her braids it looked like they might be maybe a century or more old, but this was one of the zealot defenders at Masala, one of the few bodies that we found in the excavations there, uh, this young woman along with uh, her husband and small child were found in one uh, room at Masala. Now this is the uh, last of the uh, slides that I'm going to show you and uh, I'm sure that there are a number of you here that know at least a little bit about anthropology and looking at that particular skeletal remain how would you classify that particular skeleton? Anybody got any idea? This particular skeleton threw the whole of anthropological circles into a complete state of chaos from which it has never extricated itself. You remember when we were in school, we were taught that man was the end product of a long line of evolutionary development from dry pithecus and ramipithecus and so on and so forth, on up to Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon and Homo sapiens sapiens. Well, we know today that that whole uh, transformistic concept uh, is faulty and in error. And when this skeleton was found, they identified it as a Neanderthal. It was found at the Carmel Caves in Israel. Since this particular skeleton was found in the 1930s, we have found over 200 skeletons along the uh, Carmel Ridge, around the Carmel Caves in Israel that date from a historical period of time, 70, 80, 90,000 years before Homo sapiens sapiens was ever supposed to have appeared on the evolutionary scale of development. Today, this skeleton has been reclassified not as Neanderthal, but as early Homo sapiens. And not only have Homo sapiens skeletons been found all throughout Israel, in the Middle East, but also down into Africa as well, in an archaeologically unambiguous stratum, skeletons of Homo sapiens sapiens 70, 80,000 years before they were ever supposed to appear on the evolutionary scale of development, and not only that, but they were contemporary with Pithecanthropus, 
and also with Australopithecus. Which means for us today that these earlier, early man forms hit some kind of an evolutionary dead end and died out. Whereas Homo sapiens sapiens contend, uh, continues in his own evolutionary line of development down to the present day. So archaeology is not just one little bite or one little piece uh, of the puzzle, but it encompasses all of the other scientific disciplines as well. In other words, when we find something, we don't draw conclusions based just upon archaeology, but we also consult anthropology, geology, uh, paleontology, and all of the other scientific disciplines as well. So that's the reason why I can say that today archaeology is a full-fledged science in its own right and is rapidly uh, assisting us in confirming and verifying uh, history, uh, our ancient past, or in some cases, as I mentioned, uh, refuting it and letting us know that uh, we were wrong. And so, uh, being the scientists, we're quick to uh, change our mind and change our opinions and adapt our theories whenever we're faced with or confronted with new information and new facts. Now let's take a minute and see if any of you have any uh, questions you want to ask. Any questions? Yes, sir.